let's uh, start the second talk. I'm very pleased to have um, Alessandro Vespignani, who is uh, the Sternberg Family Distinguished University Professor at Northeastern University. He is the founding director of Network Science Institute and leads the lab for modeling of biological and socio-technical systems there. He's an elected fellow of the American Physical Society, member of the Academy of Europe, and fellow for the Institute for Quantitative Social Sciences at Harvard. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to, to speak, although, you know, I would rather prefer to see you in person and uh, be able to engage uh, uh, with you in uh, in person but unfortunately this is <laughs> this is the time so um, I will talk about computational epidemiology at the time of COVID I will try to uh, give you an idea what uh, kind of work uh, uh, we do in terms of uh, uh, analysis of uh, uh, and forecast uh, scenario analysis and uh, uh, for for COVID nineteen, uh, with a focus on uh, on large scale uh, um, spatially structured models. Uh, let me uh, just say right away, if I can, uh, that you know this is work that has been done with uh, with a large number of collaborators uh, that uh, are across uh, uh, a lot of institution uh, nationally and internationally, and also the the, the contribution of. Uh, of uh, some uh, private organizations uh, for for mobility data, and uh, and this is really uh, work that uh, could have not been done without uh, such uh, such a large team of people. So uh, what has happened in the last uh, you know six months is that uh, uh, you all know is that there has been uh, a constant demand uh, for uh, analysis and uh, and uh, intelligence about about COVID. Uh, and uh, especially in terms of forecast, uh, and here, you know, we should distinguish uh, more clearly what is a forecast and what is uh, a scenario analysis. Uh, uh, so uh, let, let's say for the moment that forecast refers to things which are short range uh, from one to four weeks. Uh, uh, in the sense that you can assume that certain intervention or certain uh, certain policies are are, are in place uh, longer term uh, analysis obviously assume uh, a very large assumptions built in like you know behavior of population or policies that can last or change and so these are really more scenario analysis uh, as well as uh, you know things that range from situational awareness uh, to intervention planning uh, and uh, and and many others uh, uh, many others uh, uh, application of models and so what happens is that whoever uh, I think in, in in many cases there have been a shift from 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 simple models to more and more uh, 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 complex models uh, in order to answer those questions, and especially when you uh, start to uh, to tackle problems like, okay, what do you, what uh, what is the number of deaths that you expect in the next uh, few weeks, uh, depending on states, or as the Center for Disease Control is asking now at the county level, well, obviously, you know, the very uh, uh, simple but tractable uh, uh, homogeneous mixing models uh, that, that we use in, uh, in, in epidemiology are not generally not enough. We have to introduce uh, generally social structure like uh, age, uh, age stratified interactions. We can go to complex contact network models in which one try to map really the proximity of individuals and get a proxy of their contacts. Uh, all that uh, when is mounted spatially, you know, implies the definition of geographical subunits and then one can push things down to the level of agent-based models in which each individual is really described uh, on, a, on a very short time scale uh, and in, in settings for, for the disease transmission, which are very, very detailed. What happens is that we go from, a, a, how to say, a simple but, you know, uh, uh, generally uh, analytically tractable uh, scene to, you know, realistic model that, however, uh, must be computationally enabled and in some cases lack uh, uh, transparency. What does it mean that lack transparency is that in some cases you can push this down down to the level of 
using uh, you know machine learning on uh, signal processing uh, that you have on various proxies uh, that uh, like uh, human mobility or you know uh, all possible novel digital data streams and uh, and uh, you might get for instance forecasts or projections which are accurate uh, but obviously really at that point the, the the level of transparency that you have on the data and your understanding of the epidemics is 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 uh, is, is very limited. So what we have done in the in the past uh, in the past uh, years and then put in uh, in action uh, for for COVID is to try to focus on a, on, a, on an approach that is uh, what uh, uh, how we define mechanistic. So that uh, uh, is based on the description of the uh, mechanistic description of uh, uh, human behavior. So in terms of mobility. Uh, patterns of interactions uh, uh, through uh, equations uh, that, as we will see in some cases, to solve the problem, the, the, the multi-scale problem that we have in terms of uh, time and, and, and length scale of the problem, we have to, to define effective equations, but so that we can uh, you know, control initial conditions, uh, what are the prediction limits, uh, the interpretability of what, what we find from, from the model. And so really moving from a, a perspective that is a, more of a time series to something that is closer to, to what is done with me, uh, weather predictions. Uh, let me say that here, you know, the, 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 the way that then you ingest data and uh, the way you do parameter calibrations, et cetera, might include a lot of uh, uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence. And there are, and probably you have seen in the past days, a lot of, uh, of approaches from other speakers that, uh, that, 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 that goes in, in, in that direction that is extremely, extremely valuable. So our approach is, uh, if I can simplify, a network of networks model. Uh, this is what we have called the global epidemic and uh, uh, mobility model. Uh, here is an example of uh, the basic structure of the model in the United States, but we work globally, so we work uh, worldwide. It's a tessellation, it's a Voronoi tessellation of the world around the major transportation hubs or uh, urban areas. Uh, in the United States is uh, about uh, 500 uh, subpopulations. These are basically based enough catchment, a census area that, uh, that we can define uh, actually even at a finer scale within each, uh, each subpopulation. On top of this, uh, for, for, for those, uh, for those uh, TESOL, we, we acquire data on the number of people living there, the, their, uh, their characteristic that goes from age uh, stratification to, to, to many other uh, elements you may need for, for specific uh, uh, questions. And I mean, uh, healthcare uh, system capacity and, and so on and so forth. On top of this uh, substrate, there is uh, a multi-scale framework in which we have, first of all, a network of the uh, international uh, aviation transportation. If this is a database that provides origin destination uh, 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 traffic flow uh, across uh, all the international airport uh, in the world. Then we complement with the domestic uh, uh, origin destination traffic network. These are coming from, from official sources like the International Aviation Associ Transportation Association or the OEG uh, database schedule. Then there is a community network. So, so this is a network that generally has a much uh, shorter uh, geographical uh, uh, span and it's of the order of 50 miles, so for instance, in the US. This is transportation that is uh, coming from uh, from commuting patterns, um, and uh, and uh, uh, it's uh, uh, acquired through different data sources across the world and complemented with uh, uh, human mobility uh, data coming from a uh, uh, company like uh, like Cubic that provides. Uh, uh, location, it's a, it's a, it's a location, a digital uh, mo uh, device uh, location company. Uh, so this, as you see, is a network of networks that are uh, overimposed one on top of each other, depending on, on the different countries. And, and uh, you can imagine you can have rail networks and so on and so forth. Uh, then there is the, 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 the transmission that we have 
to simulate. So let how we could imagine this system in the simplest term. In the simplest term is a reaction diffusion on a network where individuals are like particles that diffuse on a network. The diffusion, however, the diffusion rate is governed by the actual mobility flow and the individuals are tagged through their state with respect to the disease, as well as all the other characteristics that we can associate to each individual like, uh, uh, like age, uh, uh, gender, and so on and so forth. Uh, within each subpopulation, we have a model that uh, represents the, the transmission of the disease. Now, this model is stochastic uh, so that uh, it can uh, uh, and always works with discrete individuals. So, so in this kind of simulation, we really want to avoid the problem of what we call the micro-individual. So the fact that you, especially at the very beginning of the epidemic or during the spreading phase where there are few cases, you just send out a, a you know, fraction of individuals over some place. And uh, within each uh, subpopulation, the transmission of, uh, of the disease can have different uh, different uh, uh, different way of uh, uh, different models. So uh, here, uh, what I what I show in in that simple loop is uh, would be a simple uh, uh, chain binomial process of uh, a susceptible infectious recovery model, in which basically you are just uh, working with uh, with uh, with binomial uh, uh, processes to to uh, to look at the number of infectious uh, uh, susceptible and recovery individuals in the population but this is obviously just an oversimplification and what we do is to use much uh, more refined models within each census let me tell you first before i i, I show you what we can do there uh, uh, what is the problem and 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 what is the, the, the why we have a multi-scale problem you know this is uh, uh, an area that is centered around rome and these are some traffic uh, uh, origin destination flows from the city of rome and so you see you have individuals that travel internationally uh, across the world and those travels have a time scale that generally is over uh, over one week, and then at the same time you see the network in the in the zoom in uh, in the zoom in area here, where there is all the local commuting patterns, uh, for instance, that are on the scale of uh, eight hours around uh, around the, the the urban uh, the urban center, and so that makes uh, uh, things uh, uh, in a sense uh, uh, computationally intractable if you have to use the minimal scale. So if we have to simulate everything on the scale of a single hour and, and, and look at all individuals and their whereabouts. And so what we do is to generally uh, use uh, time scale separation techniques. Uh, uh, that means that, for instance, for the short uh, uh, time scale, for the fast time scale, so the commuting time scale that is on the scale of eight hours, what we imagine is that uh, you have a mixing of the, 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 the subpopulation where generally you uh, reach uh, a stationary state, an equilibrium state in which a fraction of the other population uh, provides a force of infection on the nearby, uh, on the nearby population within a certain range of, uh, of distance. And that is, uh, uh, this, this, uh, this force of infection is calculated uh, through, uh, through these, uh, these techniques that actually introduced by, uh, uh, first by Killing and Rohani and then uh, in, in many other papers in which basically you have those probability of interactions and force of infection, effective force of infection because of the, of the quick movement of, uh, of possible uh, carrier of the disease uh, during their commuting patterns. At the same time, however, you have to introduce, uh, uh, to introduce the explicit microscopic uh, uh, traveling patterns of individuals on the long range. And this instead is done by looking at specific individuals, each one of them has a probability of traveling to a, a certain destination, and then the individual is really displaced into the other population where it will stay for, for, for a longer time. And so you see, this is uh, just to, 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 to give you uh, what are some of the, of the computational problem that, uh, that, that we have to, uh, uh, to address when, when we, you, you really span uh, time and, and, and length scales uh, at, at the global level. Uh, 
When we do the, 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 the simulation in each subpopulation, well, you can, in principle, you can also do very simple homogeneous mixing models in which the force of infection might be complicated by the interaction with the nearby population and by the inflow of, of individuals from other areas, but you can keep the, 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 the scheme uh, simple. The other way around is to introduce progressively more information, like for instance, uh, contact patterns uh, that are age stratified. So five years old have uh, less contact with people who are eight years old or, or more. And generally, you know, you can, there are uh, famous uh, uh, survey that have collected those kind of data. And in some cases, as I will show you, it's possible actually to use agent-based models to reconstruct those, uh, those effective interactions. And the final scale, the finer scale at which you can work is the one of agent-based model. For agent-based model, what you do is really to reconstruct completely what is the household structure of individuals, associate uh, uh, individuals uh, to each household with a specific age, with a specific occupation, with a specific location of work or uh, school, and from this network, uh, from this, uh, how to say, um, from those data, what you construct is a bipartite network of individuals and location and the time that they spend in that location. And by doing a unipartite projection of the network, you can find what is basically the contact network among individuals that is also specifying what kind of setting the interaction is, uh, in what kind of setting the interaction is occurring, because in each setting you might have different, uh, different probability of, uh, of uh, acquiring the infection from an infectious individual, because as you can imagine, one thing is the household, the one thing is a school, Good setting, for instance, in a in a kindergarten school or uh, you know on the workplace. And so these are much more complex model where you see you add another microscopic layer, another network into into the model. So you have the network of interaction within each subpopulation, and then they are related through a network of commuting and fast time scale through the uh, expressing force of infection on, on uh, subpopulation, which are within a certain range, generally, as I say, it is about uh, 50 miles. And then you have, you know, another network that is really the, the fact that you take some of these individuals from one network and bring into a, a different network. Let me say that if you go at this level, you, uh, you, you find a, a numerical, a large numerical, how to say you you hit the wall of the the the, the, the computational limits uh, seven billions individual at the level of uh, of of this scale is uh, is a major problem so generally what you can do is to use in specific subpopulation a very detailed structure like this one while in the other subpopulation around uh, you use uh, uh, a simpler scheme like you know age structure or 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 even homogeneous mixing models why because perhaps you are interested in a specific question for a specific county or for a specific urban area uh, and and so you take into consideration most of the heterogeneities of that area and then however the world outside is 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 is, is described at a more coarse grained coarse grained level although all the transportation and traffic flows etc instead is kept uh, data data driven uh, the other way that you can work on this is really to use the the data that you have on the population that would allow you to build the, the synthetic population as a network to actually construct those population and from there uh, find a mesoscopic description that again provides you what we call the, uh, the, the, the uh, age contact matrices. And so basically what you are doing is to construct in each of those areas the synthetic population, like if you would work with that, with that network, that network will give you the probability of interaction that you can stratify by age. In some other cases, you can stratify also in different ways. So if you are interested in different stratification, if you have the data, 
you can i don't know stratify by uh, by income you can stratify by gender so and have effective uh, basically uh, contact uh, contact patterns for the uh, stratification of choice this stratification of choice can get into the infection transmission model by really looking at specific uh, strata of, uh, of the population. So that depends on the question that you're addressing and the source of, of, the, and the, of, of all these approaches at whatever scale you, 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 you decide to work depends on the data available. Generally is a micro census data, the, 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 the one that works better because you can really do basically a resampling at the, at the, at the microscopic scale to create uh, household structures and everything else but you there are different techniques to to go around the, around those and 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 and, and basically bring micro data into a macro description that allows you to work uh, to work uh, with the model so what is the other bottleneck uh, that you have computationally well computationally now let's imagine that you know that there is the epidemic in Wuhan China that is covid-19 well, first of all, you do some modeling assumptions. So you will describe the progression of the disease according to a certain structure that is a modeling assumption. You can use, uh, you have probably seen at the early stage of the epidemic, uh, uh, there were susceptible, exposed, uh, uh, infectious recovery models. Then the, the, the people started to add asymptomatic individuals. Then you have pre-symptomatic uh, transmission. So you at uh, a stage of pre-symptomatic transmission and so on and so forth. You know, you can decide to have more or less transmissibility from kids. So there are the modeling assumptions. Then there are the initial conditions. So when we start in China, for instance, and, uh, and that's, uh, you know, again, you can use phylogenetic data that provides you some, uh, some idea about that, but you know, for sure there is, uh, there is some time range to explore. There are parameter uncertainties. So, uh, you know, that if you look at the initial early stage of, of COVID, a lot of uh, work was, how to say, providing information about the, the incubation time, et cetera, that was at large fluctuation around a, a, a certain specific values, but, you know, with fluctuation that you have to consider. In addition, there is, uh, there is the, the uncertainty of the stochasticity of, uh, of a phenomenon uh, like, like an epi epidemic spreading. As you all know, in a stochastic system, you can have two infectious individuals and they can land in, uh, in one city and they might not generate any other infectious uh, uh, individuals or they can generate a, a large cluster of individuals. So the reproductive number, for instance, is an average quantity, but in a stochastic model provides a lot of uncertainty. So, when you play with all those factors, that means that really you have to generate a large ensemble of realization of the model, and then you know consider the possible initial conditions, span the parameters, and span all the parameters uncertainty. So this is where really uh, the, the problem becomes computationally uh, expensive, because uh, uh, in some cases, it's, it's, it, in a way, it's an embarrassingly parallel uh, problem in the sense that you have just to generate a very large number of initialization and a very large number of realization for each initialization of the model. In some other cases, it's more complex if you are doing uh, for instance, Bayesian analysis in which you, you already have, uh, uh, are able to find a posterior distribution for some of the parameters by looking at specific uh, uh, time, uh, time, uh, time horizon of the model and so on and so forth. So this is, however, it's uh, what is done <laughs> exactly as in, in, in weather forecast and, and this is what is uh, uh, performed on supercomputers generally. And uh, so let me give you an idea of what the work that we did in, in China in the last, uh, now in the last uh, five, six minutes, I think I have more, yes, more or less that. So what, how we do uh, to calibrate the model is to uh, consider uh, uh, initial conditions in a certain range, and these are coming from the literature. So we have basic information on the parameter of, of the model, like what is the latency period, what is the infectious period, what is the generation time, that means, uh, or the serial interval, if you want, although the two are not the same, uh, in which you say, well, from the onset of symptom of one index case to the onset of symptom of 
the secondary case. Uh, the starting dates that, as I was saying, was coming was generally uh, one of the the the, the, the results of uh, phylogenetic analysis as well as other investigation on the field, and. Uh, a certain range of initial cases uh, for the outbreak. So these is our priors, and on those priors, the model assumes that, uh, that there is a flat distribution in, uh, in a sense. Actually, we uh, explored a larger uh, set of priors from what you, what you see here initially. And then you have a model that you define as, uh, as you see here, these are more, more complex models for the disease transmission in which you consider also hospitalization, intensive care unit, uh, uh, um, admission, you have pre-symptomatic transmission and so on and so forth. Some of those parameters are now more settled in the literature, some others are still with quite wide range. For instance, it's still uh, infectious, uh, the infection of asymptomatic is under a lot of debate and as well the, what is the fraction of uh, asymptomatic individuals depending on the what we define from uh, uh, how to say asymptomaticity or pauci asymptomaticity etc so uh, what we do at this point at this point what we do uh, is to uh, what we want is to have uh, posterior distribution with respect to the evidence uh, for uh, parameters like, for instance, the reproductive number or, 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 or other parameters of the disease. And to do that, what we do is to use as evidence the number in our model is the number of uh, cases uh, uh, exported internationally uh, from the outbreak in China in basically until January 2021st. Uh, before the major travel bans uh, to, to China and the, 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 and, and the shutdown of, of one. Well, here we have to keep into consideration that the symptomatic cannot be detected, uh, were not detected generally at the, at the, at the destination, and that uh, a lot of work done by, by other groups, like for instance, the, the, the group of Mark Lips, it just pointed out that the, most of the, also of the cases, so of the international uh, symptomatic people that were, were exported were not actually uh, identified or, or documented at the, at the destination. And that is something that is well known and is of the order of, of 60, uh, up to 60% of them. So if you consider all those things uh, and you uh, wrap up uh, those uncertainty on the detection as the, the, the uh, approximate Bayesian computation tolerance, uh, uh, you can perform a classic rejection algorithm and get, for instance, a posterior for the reproductive number of the, of the, of the distribution in China. And then from there, you can start to work on what is the, uh, uh, the evolution of the epidemic across the world. Uh, here, for instance, we shows, I show some of the results uh, uh, of, uh, of the uh, origin of cases uh, uh, detected uh, uh, internationally. You see before the uh, travel ban in Wuhan, uh, the big contributor was, was Wuhan and then Actually, after the big travel ban from Wuhan, China started to contribute cases to other countries. Uh, at this point, there was a travel ban on China. But, you know, in a sense, uh, what you are doing is you are chasing, uh, chasing the epidemic that at the same time is moving across the world. And the model is simulating all the possible patterns of this disease, which are compatible with the evidence that we have considered up to January 2021. And that allows to, to look at all the possible stories that that, that might occur after, uh, after that, that date in terms of international dissemination of the disease. This, for instance, uh, can provide some epidemiological explanation of what happened in, in the US uh, in early March uh, and uh, actually in January and February, because since uh, the, the testing uh, uh, of cases was only performed on a travel history from China, you can look at the number of cases found from, from China was, uh, was basically, they were identified, but you know, they were a very small numbers. While instead, if you look at the, the entire circulation of cases from, from uh, worldwide, you see that, that at this point on March the 1st, in the United States, in many urban areas, you have hundreds, uh, uh, if not thousands, of daily transmission of local local transmission. And if, if you look at the onset of local transmission in the United States, that is uh, basically in during the month of February, 
uh, and for some areas like uh, California, Washington State, New York State, that was uh, actually uh, uh, late January, early, early February. Uh, with importation that possibly arrived even much, much earlier than that. So uh, this is what you can recreate from the model by looking at the network of importations. And you see that, for instance, uh, uh, China is just a small fraction of the uh, of the importation that might see the, the epidemic in the in some of the states in the U.S. because there was the travel ban, and then cases started to arrive from Europe, Asia, and other places in the world. But actually, most of the cases uh, for many states are domestic importation, and these are just uh, you know the importation that define the possibility of onset uh, of local transmission. If you do the all possible importation, so in, uh, importation of cases uh, uh, in each state, uh, what we, you will find is that actually the domestic part is really the dominant part in most, uh, in most of the places. Um, what is the driver, as you can imagine? You have the, the mobility is the driver of the onset of, uh, of, uh, of transmission. And here, indeed, you can see this is the rank of surveillance in cases with our the model projection that is quite uh, quite good. This is the ranking of, uh, of, uh, of where we, we, we can find uh, 100 infection in uh, locally generated and 100 cases uh, in terms of the ranking across the states. And this is uh, correlated with the rank in air traffic and passenger volume that you have internationally and domestically. So the two things are correlated and they are both in the data and, uh, and the model. Um, I see I, I have probably to go to the, to, the, to the end. So when you have set the scene for an epidemic to take place and, 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 and in, in, in one country, at that point, if you want to have more, uh, uh, more insight on the future of that, of that epidemic in terms of forecast and, and scenarios, what you have to do is to introduce policy intervention, community re restriction, et cetera, et cetera. That is done generally through data. Uh, and then you assume a status quo for the next uh, few uh, few weeks, uh, two or three weeks. And this is, for instance, is uh, the kind of modeling that we do in the United States, in which we uh, use the death uh, uh, incidents uh, as a model selection on the uh, uh, on the on, on on the parameters that uh, that we have in each uh, in each state. Um, and the debt is because the debt probably, as, as you can imagine, is, 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 the, is, the, is the quantity that is the most reliable, at least uh, in terms of, uh, of magnitude. Although even for the debt, uh, at this point, the CDC uh, tells us that there is a one week delay on average from, from the, the, the date uh, for the real date of death and, uh, and the, the notification of, of that. And what you do is to assemble at the state level those results, generate county level aggregation that provide for the next four weeks uh, the, 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 the forecast. This is, uh, this is an exercise that we have done with the Center for Disease Control along with other, many other teams uh, in order then to generate super ensemble, uh, super ensemble uh, forecast of, uh, of the epidemic. Uh, to a four week uh, time, uh, four weeks time horizon. Uh, here again, yeah, really I want to spend the fact the importance to not rely on a single model for forecast, uh, uh, most of all, but also for scenarios. And actually using ensemble techniques for the forecast is really much, much, uh, much better. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, this is, uh, I think, the, 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 what we are seeing in terms of performance of the ensemble forecast in the United States is, is very encouraging. Uh, let me just close with this quote that actually is from 538 where they were discussing models. I think so, where it's always important and I think there were a lot of uh, um, missteps in communication in the in the past months, I think, and we are, it's, it's, it's not easy to communicate the results of models, but it's important to keep in, mo in mind that models are not to be considered oracles and they are just, you know, trying to give us, uh, you know, some range of possibilities uh, given the facts on the ground and too, too often instead uh, on media and other sources, we find those models reported as they were, uh, were actual, uh, the actual reality of what is going to unfold. And so that's, that's, uh, I, 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 I leave this uh, 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 as a closure. Thank you very much.
Thanks so much for the great talk. Um, let me see if you've got questions. There is one question about um, how do you estimate the travel rate for the infected individuals versus uninfected ones to another community? The travel, uh, if they are uninfected, is the usual uh, in, uh, in uh, traveling rate that comes from data. And then uh, this is uh, the, the point. You have to assume generally in all those models, there is uh, uh, the exposure and, and the latent stage of the epidemic. So you don't work with a model in which you have just uh, susceptible and then infectious individuals. Individuals, when they transition to the symptomatic stage, uh, generally, travel for uh, uh, one uh, to two days. Uh, and these are coming from, again, from clinical data and from studies on the field. And then they do not travel anymore if they are symptomatic and then they are or isolated or they transition to hospital, hospital setting, et cetera. But the major contribution of, uh, of, to the spread of the disease is those uh, four to five days in which individuals have been exposed and they basically are still in the latent stage and they can travel regularly. So this is the major contribution to the, to the, to the, to the diffusion. Asymptomatic individuals, unfortunately, in this case, they, they travel regularly as well as they don't, they, they don't care. So there are other questions, I think. Christian, do you have a question? Uh, I, I see questions from the audience, so maybe you should answer those. Yeah, do people study the problems of identifiability of parameters in such model? Yeah, it's, uh, this is perfectly, uh, uh, this is a major problem. So uh, uh, what is identifiability? The, the classic things is that you can have uh, uh, a different generation time and a different reproductive number. And if since, uh, you know, the, 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 the growth rate of the epidemic uh, depends on the combination of those two parameters, uh, you know, basically you might have different epidemics with different of those parameters that have the same characteristic initially. And so in a sense, if you do simulation on, on, on that, you will have non-identifiability. You will find that, you know, all the possible generation time which are associated to a decreasing reproductive number are, are viable. This is why you have to do a lot of work on, on screening parameters from, from, the, uh, from the literature on the field. And so this is why there is a huge effort in measuring uh, uh, latency times, uh, uh, generation time, uh, serial intervals, uh, pre-symptomatic transmission, because generally those are the parameters that uh, are not identifiable. For instance, even the presymptomatic transmission, you can move uh, some of the presymptomatic transmission down in the, in the symptomatic stage and the model will not change basically, but you know, and, and, and however in terms of traveling might, might do a difference. And so that, that's where, where it's important. Um, and so this is, this is, this is a major, major thing that is uh, in, incredibly important to understand where the non-identifiability is in each model. So there are a few other questions which are probably fast to answer. How long does the full run of your model take? <laughs> uh, a single run might take, uh, uh, depends obviously on the uh, time uh, horizon that you consider. So generally the global model now age stratified uh, with all the intervention, et cetera, is of the order of 10 to 15 minutes on a, on a, on a single, uh, uh, how to say, good CPU with enough, with enough memory. The problem is that we need of the order of uh, tens of thousands of those every, every times we do a calibration or every times we, we study some questions. And so this, uh, this is really, we are able to do that because it's, uh, uh, we, we are partnering with Google. And so we are basically working uh, on, on thousands of, uh, of uh, parallel instances and all the data are pipelined to a big query database so that everything is done internally. Even the amount of data, since we have to record all those transitions among compartments of individuals, uh, uh, all the information about who traveled from where to who in each realization, these are terabyte of data 
and you need also a high performance uh, data that analysis uh, uh, pipeline so this is uh, you know the computation is uh, is partially you can go around it uh, the, the, the 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 database analysis is still one of the the, the things that really it's expensive in, in a way and so we, we we indeed are we are thanking google for for providing support on that there's another question which might i think and not be a nice question which is in your model, have you analyzed the use of masks and how did cell phone mobility data help in it if you did analyze it? We didn't, uh, so the, uh, let me be specific. You can always do scenarios in which you assume that there is a specific transmissibility reduction through mask wearing and you can uh, uh, calibrate those, uh, those scenarios by looking at transmissibility in different uh, states or regions of the world uh, which have similar uh, decrease of mobility and contact uh, from, from proximity data, etc. However, the effect of mask on single person is, is, is still something that is very difficult to model explicitly. So I would say that most of the model that I've seen in circulation for the population level scale model, they use uh, mask in terms of an effective transmissibility reduction this is this is this is yeah this is done and we 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 have done some work in this sense as you can imagine there you get into those scenarios uh, analysis that will tell you yeah if everybody is very good with mask and we reduce transmissibility by 30 percent because of that we will uh, avert that number of deaths but however this is uh, these are you we enter the the, the scenario analysis uh, uh, real so the final question people asked, how can you validate your analysis of the COVID importation? For example, did people do some genetic analysis to say, okay, Alessandro predicted there were 5,000 <laughs> coming from France and we now look at the genes and yes, he was right. Yeah, there is this kind of work. There is the people that do the phylogenetic analysis, uh, and uh, we compare data data with uh, with them. And so, what uh, we do is to uh, generate, uh, uh, for instance, uh, it's very well. You know, even the phylogenetic analysis has a lot of problem because they, 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 they have to get samples and so there is the problem of sampling for them. So how many cases really you have sampled and, and how many strains you have found, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, however, they produce uh, what from uh, generally a certain uh, uh, window for the introduction time. And so we generally validate through that. So what is the time window of introduction in different countries according to the model uh, and, 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 and the phylogenetic analysis. Another thing is to look at the, uh, for instance, uh, if you look at the group of Peebles, uh, uh, in all, Oliver Peebles in Oxford, you will see that they have the number of cases uh, of uh, actually of introduction in the country uh, stratified by uh, uh, European country of, uh, of residence, uh, basically. So how many cases uh, in the UK got from Italy, from France and the other places? And we can do those kind of analysis as well. So this is where you have the, the, the validation of those models. Um, let me ask one more question. Um, yeah, please. This is a, yes, so this is by Ali. Um, and it's a technical question about you know, sort of the structure of the network. Do you see a distributional shift in the degree distribution of infected individuals? Like higher degree nodes get infected first. And in general, what's the effect of heterogeneity in influence or degrees? Yep, this is a great question. And also is a mathematical problem in the sense that we, uh, I didn't show you the microscopic data. We can really even uh, measure the shift of the degree distribution of individuals uh, through mobile uh, devices and their co-proximity with others. So, during the different stages of the, for instance, of lockdowns and uh, and uh, and constraints. so really you can look at that. You can look at the uh, the number of uh, individuals who are infected in those networks. And generally, what you have is that you have a risk, uh, which is obviously much more pronounced for individuals with uh, with uh, with a larger number of connections. Uh, what happens uh, is that uh, that means uh, introduce, uh, for instance, a change in the herd uh, immunity threshold. Uh, 
if you work with homogeneous models, we you easily get that the 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 the, the total population affected at the end of the epidemic might get to 60, 70 percent, and you have uh, inversion point for the epidemic at around uh, 30 to 40 percent. Well, if you if you do in structure model, whatever structure you have, this herd immunity threshold is smaller. And that is something that indeed I always say, is, look, don't consider the, 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 just the, 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 the consideration on the herd immunity on homogeneous model, just try to, to look at, uh, at the actual uh, uh, distribution of contacts. Uh, those distribution of contacts are not, you know, sh they should be measured and they change uh, for instance, also among rural areas with respect to urban areas and so on and so forth. So uh, th there are a lot of uh, interesting problem, assuming if those distribution of contact are uh, gamma functions or are power laws or are uh, truncated power laws, you can get different uh, the immunity threshold. So, you know, there are, there are a lot of, uh, of interesting things that happens in those networks. There, there is one plenty last, last, of other. <laughs> yeah, there is another one. I read the last one. Do we have plans to produce long range forecasts? No. Yeah. <laughs> In the sense that we don't go over four weeks. Uh, over four weeks, then you do scenario uh, analysis. You, you say, well, let's imagine that tomorrow the United States decide uh, that, uh, you know, uh, we do for four weeks of a certain policies. You know, what now at this point, making long range forecast when even the school opening uh, is uh, rediscussed every week uh, it's it's really it's really uh, difficult so assuming four weeks uh, even now doing a four weeks time horizon uh, it's a problem because we we know the policies of schools opening in most places but they are changing as we speak and so you do a four weeks analysis and then you have to <laughs> the, the the two days later you should change already the the the, the, the analysis so uh, there are many other. Uh, do you plan uh, to scenarios like vaccination? That's something that we are working with some uh, uh, with some agencies and some uh, uh, foundations in order to try to understand how to enroll eventually uh, uh, a vaccine stockpile. Uh, that uh, is again is not forecast uh, these are uh, scenarios analysis and then looking at possible uh, not optimal uh, because there is no optimal uh, things at this point but you know different uh, different approaches like uh, how, what do you do with the the, the 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 billions of doses that will be produced uh, and uh, and so there are different approaches in the way you can distribute in the population and and we are looking uh, looking at that. Um, there is uh, uh, also a lot of questions. Uh, uh, another way to worry this. Uh, the, um, Yes, another one way that we, the, there is a natural way to validate such model is to predict the things in the future and see which parts match. Is this done now? Yes, this is the constant work that we are doing is to constantly look at the results and, and, and see what we have been able to capture uh, across, uh, across the world. Uh, mm, this is something that uh, is, uh, is constantly ongoing uh, and, uh, and not just uh, in, uh, in the United States, but also in other, in other countries. And what we are trying to, uh, to do is actually is to find the good data to compare with, because you know, in, in many countries, even the number of deaths is probably just an underestimation of the, of the reality. And so there are several problems related with the real data. Uh, they think uh, uh, actually I have a question yeah, um, yeah please I mean all right so you know I remember um, maybe you know so you started you know sort of doing research on you know sort of um, pro like a stochastic models on graphs studying those yeah and now you're doing full scale simulations agent based simulations that are um, you know having looked at the real data and having done this larger scale simulations uh, what sort of questions do you think are most interesting for people who are um, studying, uh, you know, sort of more abstract, uh, you know, mathematical problems like stochastic yeah. processes on random networks? 
Yeah, that's uh, that's uh, that's uh, another great question, and uh, unfortunately, you know, this is, has been my trajectory to go from something that was, you know, in a stylized uh, environment with a specific wonderful uh, uh, degree distribution for the network. Uh, let's look at the heterogeneity and and let's see what we what we see. Then, progressively, we move into these uh, computational approaches. Uh, and now, you know, it's, it's uh, more and more, you know, get in different, uh, also other epidemics. We are used that in a way that is more, how to say, uh, oriented to actionable use of it. And so, okay, let's plug everything that we can into the approach and then let's see what, what we can understand on the actual phenomenon. I would say that there are several big questions. Uh, one question is, uh, uh, and, and on both of them, you, we, we have touched already. One is uh, what is really uh, uh, a lot uh, has, uh, has been focused on the epidemic threshold. So how the uh, heterogeneity of contact structure and other heterogeneity of the population shift the contact, uh, the epidemic threshold. The epidemic threshold, however, is not uh, equivalent uh, uh, to the herd immunity threshold for several reasons. And not equivalent to the inversion of the of the epidemic uh, of to the to the inversion point of the epidemic. So, understanding those uh, mathematically in uh, uh, more simple models would really guide a lot to what we do at the at the large scale level. Uh, in in a sense, you plug everything in, 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 in the modeling and then you have certain answers, but having guidance that will tell you, well, you have to expect that level of decrease of the, 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 the inversion point, uh, uh, the inflection point of the epidemic, et cetera, would be very, very helpful. The second part is related to the phylogenetic analysis. What we do with the model is to create uh, all the possible history of importation and exportation of uh, a with respect to a specific evidence that generally is limited. So for instance, cases uh, imported from China. But then you have all this history of things in which a case can go to Europe uh, in Germany and then from Germany to the UK and, or go to Italy and then from Italy to the UK and so on and so forth. So for instance, what we observe uh, in Europe is that uh, if you remember the history of the epidemic is that Italy was first and then the other European countries at the distance of one week or, or 10 days. Does it mean that Italy was special? No, Italy was just, uh, you know, one basically <laughs> stochastically got one week earlier there for some reasons. Uh, and then in the other places too, this is stochastic uh, effects. Uh, however, what we can do through the modeling is to look at all the possible uh, happenings of this type. And the idea is how we can use this uh, to actually inform better the phylogenetic analysis by using this as a prior, because however, not all history are possible. And so can we provide uh, methodologies that use what we get from these uh, models to provide a better prior for the phylogenetic and vice versa. So if I see this phylogenetic analysis, how I can bring this as a prior into my simulation in a way that whether it's not too, uh, and here is the issue. Obviously, if you look for the specific uh, epidemic and you have all the perfect data, the probability that you find that in, in the model is zero because it's a, an infinite dimensional space. So you will never end up on that. So. What are your, uh, you know, your, your observable and your descriptive statistics that from the phylogenetic uh, will provide us information that can improve the model or vice versa? And these are, these are major problem, I think. I, 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 I'm not, no, I don't know how to, how to, to work uh, around those at the moment. All right, thanks so much. There are still more questions coming, but I wanna make sure we have a short break between um, every two talks, so I think, our next speaker is Susan Holmes, and she will speak at 10.45, so in five minutes. And thank you very much for, for staying. We went over time, so thank you very much.